All right. Well, if not, let's get started with our lesson this morning. The last six weeks, we have been going through a series titled Basic Dispensational Lessons. And the goal of the series has been to try to set aside some of the things that make us look awkward to people, being mid ax Pauline dispensationalists. And just, let's just cover basic dispensational truth. There are a lot more dispensationalists than there are mid ax dispensationalists. And so we're just covering those basic truths. And I find a lot of people who we minister to and minister with come to a knowledge of the Bible, in a, in, and it's great they do so, through uh, understanding of the Bible rightly divided, uh, are, are not cognizant of basic dispensational lessons. So we covered those the last month and a half. Uh, the first being taking the Bible literally and why we need to do that. Uh, why is that a good thing? I mean, doesn't that cause problems when you do that? Um, we covered that. We covered the separation of the Bible between Israel and the church. Okay, and, and the problems that come with thinking that you are God's chosen nation, Israel, and, and how that's different than the church. We talked about law and grace, right, and how those are two different ways of operating and motivations we have for doing good works. And how in the church today we operate according to grace, not according to law, and those two things need to be rightly divided or distinguished in the scripture. We talked about uh, position versus condition in the scripture and, and, and that perspective on yourself and how a Christian can be called a saint even though they don't look like it and what that means, okay, which is often the case. And because we have a position, a job title, that Christians don't always live up to. And so we talked about position versus condition. We talked about uh, judgments and the different judgments in the scripture and how there are more than one and when they happen and why and what the basis is of that judgment. And last week we talked about heaven and earth. Now God had those two spheres of authority and how uh, for most of the scripture, uh, no one was looking forward to going to heaven it was only in the revelation of the mystery that Paul revealed a creature, a new creature called the church that would be promised a position in heaven. So two, two different spheres of authority in the scripture we talked about last week. So to wrap up and tie a nice little bow on this series, we're doing a chart this week dealing with progressive revelation, which is also a basic dispensational truth. Looking at the Bible as revelation from God revealed progressively. Okay, this book did not just plop out of the sky from some God-sent stork and said, here you go, here's my book. It didn't happen that way. It wasn't that there was one man that an angel spoke to and he remembered everything the angel said and wrote it down in a book. Muhammad, anyone familiar with that? It wasn't that, okay. It was a span of 1,400 years, 40 different authors, that it was a compilation of books. The word Bible means books, a library of books. Right? Thus, you have a bibliography at the end of your book, right? a list of books. That's what the Bible is. It's a holy Bible because this Bible is separate and distinct from other books, right? collections of books. It's holy. It's from God. It's to be set aside and separate. And thus, uh, this book is one of the few books in my library that has a leather cover. Uh, it's holy. I treat it that way. That's why you do that. Okay? Um, so anyway, that's what it is. And when we take the Bible and start reading it, we need to realize that it is a, a collection of books that has been written over history about different people at different times. You can't just open the Bible anywhere and say, yep, that's the verse I'm going to take as my life verse today. You can't do that because you can be pointing to a time in history. In the same way, you wouldn't take a history book, open up a history book and, and, and turn it to the 15th century and say, that describes today. It doesn't. It's describing history. In the same way in the Bible, you can't just put your finger anywhere and say, that's for me, because it could be describing a time that has long passed. Okay? In fact, from where we sit, all of the Bible is long past. And so even more need for us to be able to discern in that past which part is for us and which isn't. And it's that necessary division of the scripture, recognizing progressive revelation, which is what has confused Bible students for centuries. You know, how do we distinguish what parts of the Bible are for us and are not? How do we rightly divide and not wrongly divide the scripture? What parts do we choose? And in fact, you don't choose anything. God tells you what his mission and message is for you. And so we've been trying to study that out the last six weeks. Okay. Um, what I will not do today, and I have not talked about in the last six weeks, has been the, the number seven dispensations. Anybody ever heard of seven dispensations? The Bible. If you're familiar with dispensational books, you're familiar with there being seven dispensations, and many times people will define dispensational teaching as being a system of belief in seven dispensations, and that is simply not accurate. Okay, uh, so I'm not going to teach that lesson today. I'm not going to draw on the board seven dispensations for different reasons. Number one is I disagree with seven dispensations. 
and yet I'm more dispensational than perhaps anyone you've ever met. And I don't believe in seven dispensations. You can ask me later about why that is. Schofield was wrong. I'm a dispensationalist, and he was wrong. I get it. Okay. Dispensational Bible study comes from the Scripture, not from a man. Right? That's how we do that. Dispensational lessons, as we've studied in the past, have to do with these concepts of law and grace, heaven and earth, church and Israel, not with the number of dispensations. In fact, the discussion about how many different dispensations there have been or how God deals with humanity is the subject of dispensational Bible study. That's what we talk about. And that's what we mean when we say we're mid ex dispensational. We're Pauline dispensational. We're trying to distinguish and tell you by, by saying that what kind of dispensational students we are, what, what kind of dispensationalists we are. Okay, And so um, that, that's what we're getting at. So Schofield didn't have it all right. There are some dispensations Schofield uh, invented that, uh, well, he didn't invent them, but he mentioned that, uh, that you can't find in the Scripture. You can't find them. There's not a verse that describes it. You can think about it. This is not there. Schofield did not mention the dispensation in Ephesians 1, verse 11, the dispensation of the fullness of times. He didn't include that in his list. Another reason why I won't mention the seven dispensations is because uh, covenant theologians, those who were not dispensational at all, were already talking about seven dispensations before Schofield. He did not invent it. Isaac Watts, Jonathan Edwards, others talked about the dispensations of God, and they weren't dispensational at all. Okay? Proving the point to you, as we said at the beginning of the lesson, or the series, rather, that that word dispensation is in the Scripture. So anyone who's opened the Bible to read it has used it. Okay? So be careful that you discern uh, what, who you're reading and what you're talking about when you deal with someone about it. And number three... Dispensational Bible study does not rise or fall on the number of a dispensation. Okay? If you ask me how many there are, I'm going to tell you four or five. Uh, not seven, and we can talk about that. But uh, some people boil it down to just two. Old Testament, New Testament. Right? And so, see, the number, it really isn't, uh, it isn't something that defines dispensational Bible study. So it's not a basic dispensational lesson. More important is the concept of progressive revelation. The idea that God has revealed things at sundry times in diverse manners throughout Scripture. And we need to discern how God is dealing with humanity at this time, how he was dealing with humanity before. Okay? I'm going to read a quote to you from Miles Coverdale in his prologue to his version of the Bible back in the 16th century. Uh, this is on the back of one of our tracts, by the way, if you want a copy of it. He says, Now will I exhort thee, whosoever thou art that readest the Scripture, if you find aught therein that thou understandst not, or that appears to be repugnant, give no temerarious, nor, look it up, <laughs> nor hasty judgment thereof, but ascribe it to thine own ignorance, not to the scriptures. What's he saying? He says, you come to the Bible and you find something hard to believe or disgusting to you, or that you don't like, which I, I think is a lot of people in our culture today. They say, well, there's things in the Bible I just don't like, I don't understand. He says, if you come to that point, don't ascribe it to God's problem, but to your own ignorance. Okay, because this is the approach to the Bible that God is wiser than me, right? So if I don't like that part, then there's something I'm not understanding or something I'm not getting and saying, well, how can a moral, righteous, perfect God do that? Well, ascribe that to your ignorance is what he says. This is a suggestion because if you don't, you're never going to grow further in the knowledge of the truth. Because at that point, you've said God is an evil monster and I am better than him. Now, you've reversed the tables, right? Let God be true and every man a liar, is what Romans 3 says. So you come to the scripture, letting him be true. Think that, he says, continued, think that thou understandest it not, or that it hath some other meaning, or that it is happily overseen of the interpreters, or wrongly printed. Right, so, <laughs> I, I encourage you against the last one, which is why you maybe put the last on the list. But he said, uh, always consider maybe there's something I don't understand, something I'm missing, some other meaning. Uh, I'm wrong, is essentially the point. You are in the wrong. And when you come to that, the Bible that way, you will learn something. He says again, it shall greatly help thee to understand Scripture, if thou mark not only what is spoken or written, but of whom, unto whom, with what words, at what time, where, to what intent, and what circumstances, considering what goes before and what follows after. Except that it's 1535, 16th century. Okay. That sounds like something I would like to say. He quoted it first. I got to quote him, right? When you read the Bible, just don't consider what is being said, but to whom it's being said. And why are they saying it? What's the context? When? At what time? Because when you start looking at these details, maybe that'll help you grow an understanding of the Scripture. Instead of you just reading something and say, that can't be right. God's wrong. 
you're wrong, ask questions about the context. One reason why we study the Bible dispensationally and draw these charts on this giant whiteboard is to help you understand the context. And so we draw charts trying to display what the Bible is talking about at different times from beginning to end. So that you have in your mind a mental context so that when you do flip to the Bible, you'll have at least a framework to say, well, this part of the Bible is talking about this context, and so I need to make sure I look at it through that lens. Right? And so when you look at the Old Testament, talking about God telling parents to stone their children or whatever it is, that's in a context. Right? The context of the law. Right? God tells parents to stone their children. He doesn't tell them to stone their children. He tells children to obey their parents. He says the punishment can't be stoning, and it's a maximum punishment, children. It's not a required punishment. So that's your grace, right? Your parents say, God told me to stone you if you do this. You just say, wait a minute, mercy on the court, right? And, and they can give you a lesser punishment. And so uh, th that's the uh, jury rights there. Anyway, so just to recognize the context you're in. We're not under law. The law given to Israel, which had to do with rebellion and culture and society, we're not under that law. You're in America, folks, not Israel 2,000, 3,000 years ago, right? You have American's law, right, which is different than Jewish law, some good, some bad. But in the church, there is no law. I don't mean in the building, I mean in the spiritual body called the church. You're not under law. You operate according to grace. And that is a liberty and a freedom from which the ideas of freedom and liberty through history have come, okay? Which is why people stand fast in liberty, because they have liberty in Christ. And we see that through history. So, this idea in the scripture that we need to understand the context is important. You say, how else do other people look at it? Well, they look at it from the perspective that everything in the Bible is to them. That's the opposite way of looking at it. You can either understand progressive revelation, there's different context, and you don't fit everywhere in the Bible, or all the Bible's for me. And that is the difference. That's the opposite way of viewing the scripture. Okay. And so when we look at the Bible, and we say, well, there was Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and here's my tree in the Garden of Eden that they shouldn't eat of, right? You can say, well, that's the diet God prescribed for us, right? Because God told Adam and Eve to eat the seeds and the nuts, not the animals. And uh, people take that. There are, there are people who claim to be Christians who say, this is God's ordained diet. Look at the Garden of Eden. That's what he wanted from the beginning, right? Well, wait a minute. What context are we living in? We're not in the Garden of Eden anymore, right? And something happened, crucial happened, in that garden when they sinned, and they were kicked out. And God himself was the first one to kill an animal. So, if you're trying to prove that God doesn't want us to eat animals, Genesis 1 is not the place to go, right? Now, I'm not here saying God's purpose was for us to all kill all the animals or anything like that. I'm just simply saying that we need to know the context, okay? Garden of Eden. When you look back here and you read Genesis and you see that there's a flood, and God killed everyone on the planet, and so I'm going to draw crossbones in the water to indicate that there are only eight people on that boat, and all the other people, millions of them, were in the water dead, was a picture of God's judgment. If you think that's how we're supposed to operate, or that's how God's operating today, you'd be wrong. Right? So you understand the context. If you go back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and, and the nation of Israel, and the law on Mount Sinai, and all the prophets, and you say, that's how we should operate. Well, you'd be wrong, for context. But the way of viewing the scripture, Genesis, Exodus, Deuteronomy, all the prophets, the law and the prophets, that this is all for you, is the opposite of dispensational Bible study. It's not recognizing that as we walk through scripture, God progressively reveals more and more information about what he's, he wants you to do. Okay? And, and what he's doing. Yes. <clears throat> so I'm going to draw the cross up here. As an event uh, representing Jesus' life in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where in Jesus' life, he came as the Messiah, as you know, right? And the entire Old Testament was looking forward to the Messiah coming. And you've heard people say, well, in the Old Testament, they're looking forward to the cross, and we're looking backward to the cross. You've heard that preached, right? Be careful of the danger in that. Because they didn't understand the mystery kept secret. They didn't know why Christ had to die. What they were looking for was a Savior. They were looking for a Messiah, not someone to die. Okay? If uh, you thought Donald Trump was our Savior, you'd be wrong. But you thought he was the Savior, and then when he got elected, he said, well, now I'm going to die. You'd be like, wait a minute. What about your term? 
right? This is the idea. This is the picture of Jesus, my illustration, that Jesus came to be the Messiah. When he said, I got to die, they're going, wait a minute. You're the king. You're supposed to rule this place. Okay? And so, you see, they were looking for a Messiah. They weren't looking for his cross. They weren't looking for his, the gospel that we preach today. <clears throat> but the idea that everyone in the Old Testament are looking forward to the cross is opposite of dispensational Bible study. That everyone operated the same understanding in the same way. That the Bible is just a list of rules, a book of Proverbs. It's just insights for living. Is that Chuck Swindoll? That that's just the Bible. the Bible. He used to be the president of a dispensational seminary. Right? But the idea that, <clears throat> that, uh, that all the Bible just has rules and insights for your living, ways for you to live. So what good is the Bible to the Christian? Well, anywhere in the Bible will give you how you ought to live. The opposite of dispensational Bible study. Okay? We need to recognize the context. Who is God speaking to? What part of the Bible is to us? Yes, we learn from every page of the Bible. We don't learn what God is doing today on every page of the Bible. Okay, we don't learn what we ought to be doing today on every page of the Bible. The Bible is not just a list of rules. The Bible has history books, and there are Proverbs, but also prophetic books. And there's narratives of Jesus' life. There's epistles, letters, different types of books in this Bible. It's not just a list of rules. There is a part of the Bible that lists rules, but there's another part of the Bible that doesn't. And so, I mean, this, is, this is elementary Sunday school information. Kids are going to listen to back, right? There's different parts of the Scripture. But this is the beginning of dispensational Bible study. <clears throat> when you look at the Bible, rather than being a list of rules, the Bible is more often a record of the history of God's dealings with the world, with humanity specifically. Okay? It's a history. And you've heard the preacher cliche that history is simply what? His story. Right? Well... <laughs> All right, that sounds, that sounds nice. Uh, but it is told in story fashion quite often. There's narratives and historical books, and Jesus' life has lots of stories in it. People don't study Paul because Paul never tells stories. He's more of a professor, right? He's talking about doctrine, doctrine, doctrine. Paul's ever many stories. Maybe some of the kids have learned Paul's stories in the back. Right? Maybe that's all you've learned <laughs> is Paul's story in Acts 9 other places. But the Bible is, is, a, is, is told of a history, okay? And you can't tell a story backwards. Can't. Right? Anyone? Romeo and Juliet, for example. You know the story? Let me tell you a story of Romeo and Juliet. They drank poison and they died. And then, <laughs> spoiler alert, right? <laughs> you can't start from the end. Wait, who's Romeo and Juliet? Why did they die? Why did they drink poison? <laughs> uh, that's the end of the story, right? You say, it's like a sad story. Yes, it is. But you can't start at the end. You, you can't start backwards. Maybe a more culturally relevant story, a Superman, right? It, you know the story of Superman and how Lois Lane does not know that Clark Kent is Superman until the end. You started the story with, well, there's Superman and, and, and Lois Lane and she knew that he was Clark Kent. It ruins the whole thing. The surprise is gone. The denouement, you know, it's not there. Horrible. But this is how Christians treat the Bible. They come to the Bible and they don't start from beginning to end. They don't read it as progressive revelation, as there's steps to this explanation of revelation. Instead, it's like, everything is for you. And they'll take anywhere and say, it's for you. Well, you're taking it out of context, out of the order that it should be taken in. Okay? If you read Little Red Riding Hood backwards, you'll think she intended to be eaten by the wolf, and she didn't. So you have to read it in order. Okay? Also, you just can't tell a story jumping from place to place. The Bible's not a choose-your-own-adventure book. Remember those? I don't know if they have those anymore. But they used to have these books where you read like half of it, and then at the midpoint, there's like two options at the bottom, and you can choose what to do, and then you go to page 150, and you go there, and then go to page 35. You go back and forth in this book to create your own adventure. You can't do that in the Bible. You can't say, now I'm in Exodus, where do I want to go? Proverbs. And I'll go to Proverbs, and I'll go to Matthew, then I'll go to Revelation, and then that's going to be a bad way to learn what the Bible says. Okay? I mean, you'll eventually get it all, but now you have to put it all together. How does that work? Right? I drew a cross here, and there's a lot of whiteboard left. All right? All of this stuff describes from Genesis all the way Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay? That's, that's what I just drew up here in summary. That's the majority of the Bible. I mean, all of this of the Bible I just drew for you. you say, it saved me a lot of time. I know. Right? This part of the Bible. And a lot of this isn't even history. A lot of this part on the right side, the New Testament so-called part of the Bible, 
is simply doctrine, doctrine, doctrine. I mean, the cross, he dies in Matthew, Luke, and John, and by the way, he dies at the end of those books, right? And if he dies at the end, when does the New Testament begin? Not until the end. Hebrews 9.15, Hebrews tell us that a testament, your last will and testament, does not come into effect until you die. Jesus' testament doesn't begin until he's dead. You see, so the New Testament can't begin until he dies. But the New Testament portion of your Bible is just doctrine, doctrine, doctrine. The book of Acts is pretty, pretty good with stories. Pentecostals love the book of Acts. It's filled with stories of Holy Spirit power. Right? And that goes another, you know, 30 or 40 years beyond here. After that, you got doctrine, doctrine, doctrine. 13 epistles of doctrine. Right? Another dozen or so epistles of doctrine. Revelation's future stuff. So we'll go to Revelation. You go from Acts to Holy Ghost power to Revelation, more stories there. You skip the epistles, and you're going to miss one of the most important parts of your Bible. Right. There's not a lot of stories after this, is there? Hmm. Anyway, we need to get the story straight. If all we had was the Old Testament, if all we had was this here, Old Testament doctrine, then we would think that God's dealing the same way with everybody at all times. If all we had an understanding of this, then we would think God deals the same way with everyone. Jesus was born under the law. Moses was born under the law. Right? God told Abraham to offer sacrifices. Same way. So we read Psalms, we read Jeremiah, we read Isaiah, and it's all doing with the same stuff. But there's a grave mistake. Not recognizing progressive revelation, God came back and revealed something else to the Apostle Paul that was not known back here. He's revealing things progressively. Okay? Times change in the Bible. Can I get some volunteers? Some young volunteers that can read. <laughs> oh, and I'm sorry about that. The requirement is you have to be able to read. <laughs> read, can you help me out? Yeah, see, I, that was a hint. He didn't take it. <laughs> right, can, can you turn to Micah chapter 4, verse 3? I need another volunteer that can read. <laughs> I would choose you. <laughs> Go on, but you can't read the verse yet. Uh, thanks, Nate. Can you take Joel chapter 3, verse 9? We're going to do some Bible study this morning. And we're doing this uh, by reading Micah and Joel. Okay. Read, you should be in Micah chapter 4, right? Read, teach us what Micah chapter 4, read verses 1 through 3. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and, that shall, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and the people shall flow unto it. Many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us the ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among many people, and rebuke strong nations far off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning Nation shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Thank you. So according to Micah 4.3, I'm going to put you on the spot, Reed. According to Micah 4.3, are they learning war anymore? Are, are they fighting? What, what are they doing with their weapons, their swords? Micah 4.3, turning them into plowshares. Turning into pruning. A pruning hook is for eating, right? For fixing your food, spears for catching your animals. You're not fighting at all. I could spiritualize this thing and talk about Woodrow Wilson, or I don't know, our present administration or something like this, and say, we are God's kingdom, we are God's nation, and so we're going to judge among the people and rebuke strong nations afar off, North Korea, Assyria, right? And we're going to learn war no more after, of course, we do the war. <laughs> the war to end all wars, right? That's what Micah 4.3 is talking about, the war to end all wars. And it says you're not going to learn war anymore. Peace on earth. What about Joel chapter 3? Nate, you got this one? 3 verse 9. 9 and 10. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare for make up mighty, the mighty men. Let all the men of the war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares and your swords. 
and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Okay. So what are you telling us, Nate? Are we supposed to prepare for war? Yeah. Are we supposed to take our spears and pruning hooks, turn them back into swords? All right. So we have two Bible verses <laughs> telling us the exact opposite things. One says, don't learn war. That's what Reed's teaching us. He's a peacenik. He wants peace. He says, don't fight. Micah 4, verse 3. And here comes Nate, and he says, no, fight. Joel 3, 9 and 10. Turn those pruning hooks back into swords. What do you do? But you see what we're doing here is reading the story out of context. We're jumping around. We're not seeing the order. We're not seeing how they fit together. We're not studying it dispensationally. We're cherry-picking verses. We're just, I just told, right, put, pulled a verse out of my pocket and said, read it. Right? I knew beforehand, but I'm just, that's what people do. They look for verses to defend what they want to do, and they find a verse to support it. This is the wrong way to do Bible study. Okay? We need to understand what God is doing through history, progressively revealed on a timeline. There's an order to things. You need to have that timeline drawn in your mind. Look at Mark chapter 2. The principle this morning is progressive revelation. Not everything in the Bible is applicable to you. It's impossible for you to do everything in the Bible, as we just saw Micah 4 and Joel 3. You can't fight and not fight at the same time. Right? In Mark chapter 2, we have a good illustration that not everything in the Bible happens at the same time. In Mark 2, verse uh, 19. The disciples of John and the Pharisees used to fast, and they came and say unto him, Why do the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples fast not? Jesus' disciples did not fast. You know this, right? People say they want to teach fasting for Christians. Well, Jesus' disciples didn't fast. John's did. Prophets of the Old Testament did. So they asked Jesus, Why do your disciples not fast? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. Jesus says they're not fasting, but the days will come when they will. Isn't it important for his disciples to know when those days are, to know if they should fast or not? Yes. So when a Christian says, should we fast? And people have this question. How do you answer this? Well, I think we should. I'm going to find a verse that says we should. I don't think we should. I'm going to find a verse that says we shouldn't. Maybe better than both solutions is trying to find what time which we live in and what God's instructions are to us now. Because there's a time where God told people to fast and a time where God told people not to fast. But what time is it? Right? Jesus said, while the bridegroom is with them, they won't. And when he leaves, they will. Right? We'll talk about fasting another time if you have that question. But I'm just illustrating the point here. There's a change in instruction. Look at Luke, Luke chapter 9, verse 3. I need another participant here. Luke, I volunteered you. Can you read Luke chapter 9, verse 3 to me? To the group. There's not another Luke in here. Right? I'm sorry, what? There's not another Luke in here. Right? No, there's not. <laughs> uh, 9 3? Luke 9 3. Through what? Or just 9 3 be fine. And he said unto them, Take nothing for your journey, neither staves, nor scrip, neither bread, neither money, neither have two coats apiece. Now Luke's a good Jesus follower. He knows that whatever Jesus says, he's going to do. And when Jesus says in Luke 9, to, on your journey, take neither staves, nor scrip, nor bread, nor money. Okay, none of you do that when you go on vacation. None of us do that when we go on evangelism trips. That's what Jesus told his disciples to do. And so, if you're a singing evangelist group, you can go around and claim that and say, I didn't take any money this morning. I need some. <laughs> you know, you could sing that verse. But as a Jesus follower, shouldn't we do that? Or maybe we, we ought to think, stop and think, wait a minute, who's he talking to here? And at what time? What are they doing? I mean, he just read one verse after all. I mean, him being a good dispensationalist asked me, do you want me to read any more? Because he knows reading one could be problematic. But this is how Christians use the scripture. In Luke chapter 22, by the way, they use it wrongly that way. In Luke 22, verse 35, in the same book, the same Jesus to the same disciples. In Luke 22, verse 35, says unto them, When I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said nothing. 
Then said he unto them, But now he that hath a purse, let him take it. Likewise his script, He that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Jesus changes his instructions. He said, I follow Jesus. Good. I do too. He's the Lord and Savior. He's God Almighty in the flesh. But what instructions do you follow from Jesus? It would be a good question to ask. Because even in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he changes his instructions based on the time. In Luke 9, they went. And apparently, supernaturally provided for because he's asked, did you need anything? And they said, no. He says, but now I'm telling you, you should better take it. Most likely because he's about to die. He said, I'm not going to be with you anymore. So when I leave, uh, yeah, I can't multiply those loaves anymore. So take your money. Take a sword, right? And so which instructions from Jesus do you follow? Luke 9, Luke 22. You've got to figure that out. You've got to discern the times. You've got to rightly divide. You have to understand progressive revelation. If you don't know that Jesus says further things in Luke 22 and you stop at Luke 9, you'll be doing the wrong thing, right? If Luke was writing to you. On a simple level, this is a way you can explain to people and see in your own that not everything in the Bible happens at the same time and applies to the same people. Progressive revelation happens. Look at Hosea chapter 1. We can spend a whole lesson on Hosea. Hosea 1 is an awesome chapter to go through. We'll go through it quickly here. All the Bible is like this, folks. Pay attention to the timing words in the scripture. What comes after? What comes before? When does it happen? What part are you living in? There is a past, there is a future, there is a present. Hosea chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord that came unto Hosea, the son of Beer. If you want bad marriage advice, come to Hosea 1. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Bad marriage advice is Hosea 1. You cannot pluck any verse out of the Bible and say, this is God's word to me. If you do it in Hosea 1, you're in trouble. I'm telling you, you're in trouble. Okay, Hosea 1, verse 2. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. The Lord said to Hosea, go take unto thee a wife of whoredoms. Oh, wait a minute. Don't do that. But God told him to do that. Told him specifically. Who? Hosea. You don't do that. Okay, Paul says, marry in the Lord, 1 Corinthians 7. And in verse six, 3, rather. So he went and took Gomer, daughter of Diblam, which conceived and bare him a son. And the Lord said unto him, Call his name Jezreel. Okay, God told Hosea what the name is baby. There is not a verse in the Bible that tells God what the name of your baby. You'll not find it. Okay? I know a lot of us have good Christian names, right? My name's not in the Bible. Some of you do, though. Luke. <laughs> uh, you know, some Bible names. This is fine to have a Bible name, but there's no verse in the Bible that tells you what to name your baby. This is a choice that God has left up to you. And praise God for that, or else we all be called David, you know. <laughs> Right? David and Paul and whatever else. There's only so many names in the Bible. But see, there are some choices God leaves up to you and others that he doesn't. To know the difference, we have to know what God is telling us to do. We have to understand this progressive revelation. <laughs> understanding Hosea is not talking to us, it's talking to Hosea. Under Israel's law program, a prophet to Israel. The reason why he told him to do this is to communicate a message to Israel. Hosea 1 in verse uh, 4, he had a son and named him Jezreel. Why? Because Jezreel meant something to the Hebrews. For yet a little while I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu and will cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel. God says the very nation that he created at Mount Sinai, the nation he created with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he says, I will destroy the house of Israel. Name your child Jezreel and use your, walk with your child into town and say, this is Jezreel. His name means you're all going to be destroyed. You know, that... Not a popular guy, Hosea 1. But this is what God's telling him to do. Imagine if you're Jezreel. <laughs> you don't get invited to very many parties, you know. But um, he says he's going to cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel. If you read Hosea 1 verse 4 and say, that's for today, right, then we should destroy the house of Israel, right? But wasn't there a verse in the Bible where God creates the house of Israel and protects them? Yeah, there was. You see, Hosea is talking about a specific time. By the way, I skipped that time in verse 1. Those things that we skip because they're boring to read are crucial to understand. Hosea 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord that came unto Hosea. Who is he speaking to? Hosea, the son of Beeri. When was he speaking to him? In the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Hahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah. In the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. You're like, I didn't learn anything from that. Yes, you did. You learned when he is speaking. And that's crucial. 
Because we can take this Old Testament and blow up and draw our own chart of it and say there's a time in which Hosea was written. It was written to it in a time of Israel's disobedience. And so Hosea wants to talk about their punishment. Okay? It takes nine months to have a baby, and children grow up. And in verse 6, Hosea had another child. She conceived again and bare a daughter. God said unto him, Call her name Lo Ruama. Her name meant something too. For I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. Another message. Another baby, another message. In verse 7, I will have mercy upon the house of Judah. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Did you get that? Verse 6, I will not have mercy upon the house of Israel. Verse 7, I will have mercy upon the house of Judah. Does it matter if you're Israel or Judah? Sure does. Because if you're Judah, you get mercy. If you're Israel, you don't. Right? If you're Israel, what's happening to you and your house being destroyed is God doing it. If you're Judah, that wind that knocked over that plant in your yard was not God doing it because he said, I'm going to have mercy on you. Right? So when Christians look at circumstances and say, oh, God did that, for good or for better, how do you know? Did God say he was doing that? No, I just have a feeling. I think God's that type of guy. You, know, you have no verse to, to support this. Hosea 1, those are two verses where if you're in the house of Israel and you're being destroyed, Hosea told them they would be beforehand so they could say, yeah, that's God doing it. Because God said he was doing it. And if you're in Judah and you're being protected from the destruction in Israel, by the way, Israel and Judah are different places, right? You know that? Then you could say, oh, God's protecting me. He's got a hedge of protection around Judah. Why? Because he said so. He said so. Christians don't have the right to say such things unless they have a verse to support it. Okay? Show me the verse that God is condemning certain ones and protecting certain ones, especially today. And I'll, I'll agree with you about whatever circumstance-driven God-blaming you're doing. Okay? But you see, another example here, important to know the context, who is speaking to whom, and when are they talking? In verse 8, Now when she had weaned low Rama, she conceived and bare a son, another child. Big happy family here. Then said God, call his name Loami. For ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. People read that, especially in the New Testament, 1 Peter 2, and say, oh, these are the Gentiles. You ever heard that? Who are the people that are not God's people? They say, Gentiles. Not in Hosea 1, verse 9. Hosea 1, verse 9 are the people that were God's people, but are not God's people anymore. Right? That, that's a hard saying. That's a sad thing, folks. Right? Talking about disowning someone. You used to be my son, you're not anymore. I hope you don't ever hear that, right? You used to be my husband, you're not anymore. Hope you don't hear that. Isn't that called divorce? Isn't that bad? It is. That's what God's saying here. You were my people, but you are not my people. I will not be your God. Hmm. Something's happening. Israel, at this time, is disobedient to God and is breaking their covenant. And God's responding accordingly in verse 10. The number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, You are the sons of the living God. Now, where was it said that you are not my people? In verse 9. <laughs> to Israel. And those people, it will be called, he says, You are the sons of the living God. Prophecy can be confusing. Are you confused? <laughs> Prophecy can be confusing. You know why? Because you read 10 verses and you just covered three or four kids, you know, life here and the future of Israel. It said, I'm, I'm not going to be your God, yet I will be your God. Make up your mind. Okay? Look at 1 Peter 1. <clears throat> if you've ever had trouble reading prophecy, you're not alone. Prophecy was recorded so that when it's fulfilled, you'll know God knew it. <laughs> That's why it's written there, okay? But it's often not easy to read on its own. And that's because in prophecy, it's speaking about all sorts of things that will happen in the future that the prophets had no idea when they would happen, okay? If you're under prophecy and listening to the prophets, you would do what they say, and it seems like all of it's talking about us. You're just trying to figure out when. In 1 Peter 1, in verse 10. Peter says, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching, the prophets were searching, the prophets and Hosea and Jeremiah were all looking for what? They're looking for a Messiah. They're looking for a kingdom. We'll draw the kingdom over here. 
Okay, they're looking for a kingdom on earth. They're looking for a king. Right? They're looking for salvation. And Peter says they're searching what? Or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. The prophets prophesied things and didn't know when they were prophesying about. Okay? They said things like God's going to destroy the house of Israel and then he's going to build up the house of Israel and they said them right next to each other and he goes, that's confusing. <laughs> God, what are you going to do? And when are you going to do them? It's kind of like the story idea. I tell the story backwards, you're confused. Okay. The prophets spoke about the future, but they didn't know when it was going to happen. The benefit you have is of hindsight. Okay. Half the prophecies have been fulfilled. So what do you know? You know when that happened, right? And what didn't happen then will happen in the future. Okay? This is why you need to rightly divide the scriptures, the prophecies. What happened when? Did it happen in the past? Is it happening now? Is it happening in the future? And you can tell that because you're living now. If you were living 2,000 years ago, you'd be struggling with it. In the same way people struggle today about the future, when you're looking at the future, it's always hazy, folks, because we can't see the future. Do you know what's going to happen in your future? No. You say, I got a book that tells me what's going to happen. Yeah, and they argue about it left and right. Because it hasn't happened yet. But what we can know for certain is what has happened and what hasn't happened. That's what we can know. Okay? This is a basic dispensational lesson. Progressive revelation. Things happen over time, not all at once. Okay? Look at, first, or look at uh, Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. When Peter preaches in Acts chapter 3, what the prophets spoke since the world began, and here's Peter on our timeline, and he spoke what the prophets said since the world began, Peter was simply talking about the fulfillment of these things. That's what was going on in Acts 3.21. When Paul says in Romans 16.25 that he's preaching what was kept secret since the world began, apparently he's got information that these guys didn't know about. Okay, something kept secret. In Acts chapter 9, <clears throat> in verse 3, notice what happens here. In verse 1, we have the context of Saul, who is Paul. Same guy, different name. Saul was breathing out threatenings and slaughters against the disciples of the Lord and went to the high priest. If I were to ask you, was Paul, was Saul a, obedient to God? You should ask, if you're astute, well, what part of his life? Right? Because in Acts 9, verse 1, he is chasing after and threatening the disciples of the Lord. Right? He gets saved in this chapter. This is his conversion. In Acts 9 verse 2, he desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues that if he found any of his way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. He's going to arrest these disciples of the Lord. And he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from where? From heaven. Here's Jesus Christ. Okay, from heaven, appearing to the Apostle Paul. In Acts 9, verse 15, the Lord says, Go your way. Paul is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. Paul goes from the enemy to apparently the apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ sent Paul from heaven. Okay? Look at 1 Thessalonians 4. In 1 Thessalonians 4, some of you recognize this chapter as being the chapter dealing with what people call the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13, I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, where? In the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. The Bible talks about Christ coming to earth. Okay? The prophets spoke about a Messiah come. And what we learn dispensationally, that as we learn the Bible progressive revelation, that Christ has come many times. You understand this? He came 2,000 years ago to earth. Right? Do you know he came back in Acts 9? People talk about the second coming of the Lord. Well, he went to heaven, and then he returned to Paul. But he didn't set foot on the planet. It was from heaven he saw that light. In 1 Thessalonians 4, we see Christ return. He appeared to Paul in heaven and sent him to preach the gospel of the grace of God. Christ returns in 1 Thessalonians 4 in the air with the trump of God and the shout of the archangel. And what happens to the church? We meet him in the air. He receives the church to himself. Okay? You see this? He came down to the earth. He went to heaven. He appeared to Paul. He left. He appears again. The church goes up. And apparently, Christ comes again. Didn't we learn that last week? He comes to set up his kingdom. What are we talking about? You say, Christ is coming. Yes. Which one are you talking about? You say, Christ came. Yes, he did. Which one are you talking about? Knowing when is important. This is what dispensational Bible study does. It is a fundamental of Christianity that you believe that Christ will return, that Christ came. It's an aspect of dispensational Bible study that we distinguish every time he came and what he came for. Okay. Here he'll come back to the earth. And he'll come back to fulfill those things he promised before for the earth. In this dispensation, he appeared from heaven to Paul, telling him from heaven what he wants the church to be, ambassadors from heaven. And he'll return in the air to take us to heaven, because that's where we're going. He never comes back to the planet. You understand this? He's in the air. You get sucked up. Or something. I don't know what happens. The only I can think of, you're being sucked up. But Jesus appeared already. Okay. Look at uh, Psalm chapter 118. I'm trying to show you the importance here of progressive revelation and discerning the times in your Bible. You who understand the revelation of the mystery given to Paul, the dispensation of grace, which God is operating according to right now, understand what has happened previously in time past and what will happen in the future. You can discern things that the prophets did not understand. In Psalm 118, for example, let's read this. Psalm 118 in verse 22. It says, The stone which the builders refused is become the head stone of the corner. What is this verse talking about? Jesus Christ, right? And it says, The stone which the builders refused. When did that happen? What did that happen? The stone which the builders refused happened here. Jesus is the stone. Okay? He is the rock. He is the foundation. He came to earth. He was the Messiah. He preached, I'm the Christ. I'm the one you've all been looking for. I'm here. It's time to fulfill all the prophecies. And they rejected him. But this verse said, the stone the, building, the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. When does he become the headstone of the corner? When does he establish his kingdom? Over here. Okay. In Daniel, that stone comes from heaven and destroys the kingdoms of the world and sets up his own kingdom. In Psalm 118, 22, do you notice that 2,000 years ago and the future is separated by a space in your Bible? If you just read that verse, you'd think it happened at the same time. You think, oh yeah, that must happen. When does that happen? Oh, that happens at the same moment, right? We know differently now. 2,000 years ago, Christ was refused. The kingdom hasn't come yet. All right. Look at Isaiah 9, verse 6. You all seen Charlie Brown, Christmas special? Linus, right? He reads to you Isaiah 9, verse 6. Only not the whole thing. Linus, you have to understand, I mean, he is a kid, 
in the cartoon, right? So, I mean, he's got some growing to do. He doesn't rightly divide the scriptures, which, I mean, what do you expect? He's Linus, right? But um, you just have to understand that, because in Isaiah 9, verse 6, the prophecy says, For unto us a child is born. Right? You, sound familiar? When did that happen? Here. Unto us a child is born. Obviously, Dallas Nearest goes when this happened. Right? Unto us a son is given. When did God give his son? John 3, 16, right? That was years ago, right? And then there's a colon. <laughs> and then after the colon, it says, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Um, that didn't happen, right? Linus didn't read that part. Okay, Luke 2, 11, which is what Linus reads, right, is the first part of Isaiah 9, verse 6. Unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. Fulfilled, check mark, colon, and the government's given to him, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Priests, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. That has not happened, folks. It has not happened. That's it. The Bible's wrong, right? Or we understand that everything in the Bible happens at the same time. And so the prophecy and the prophets were trying to figure out when this would happen and couldn't figure it out. They thought everything would happen at once. Actually, we know half of it happens before, the other half's in the future. The child born 2,000 years ago needed to die first, be refused, and then he'd return to establish his kingdom. You see? Right? Two comings. The cross, and as Clarence Larkin says, the crown. You see, who's Clarence Larkin? He wrote this really old book right here called Dispensational Truth in 1918, a hundred years ago. This is not new information. He had beautiful charts, if you have one. Some people call this the greatest book on dispensational truth. I wouldn't go that far. But it's called Dispensational Truth. It has a lot of pretty pictures in it, lacking color, because they didn't have that sort of color printing at the time. But great pictures. And you can find one in here about the two comings of Christ. He came for the cross. He comes for the crown, and this is a basic dispensational truth, that the prophecies are separated by time. Time matters. Progressive revelation. Okay. Let's look at Isaiah 42. You're in Isaiah. Isaiah 42. This happens all over Isaiah. All over the prophecies. Remember Peter said the prophets inquired what and what manner of time these things would happen. They didn't know. And Peter says they were trying to seek what manner of time that the sufferings and the glory that should follow would occur. Because all the prophets spoke about suffering and glory. Remember Hosea? I'm going to destroy you and I'm going to bring you back. Suffering and glory. A child refused and then a king received. Suffering and glory. Suffering and glory. Suffering in the past, glory in the future. Time separates them. How much time, by the way? It's been 2,000 years. And counting, right? So when we talk about suffering, what does Paul say about glory? Romans 8, 18. Is the glory now? Paul says, we reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. Right? Shall be. Romans 8, 18, Paul says, glory is future. So glory is here. Suffering is here. And apparently persists here. Because where's Christ right now? He's not on earth in his kingdom. He's in heaven telling us to preach something. Right? Time separates them. Should we then expect in, in this time, in this life, God's kingdom on the earth? If you understand the difference in time, you'd say it's not time yet. In the same way, you couldn't go to the manger in Bethlehem 500 years before Jesus was born and say, I'm going to wait. It's going to happen any moment. No, it was prophesied to happen when it did, and there was a time. There was a star, there was angels, there were people communicating the right time, and the wise men came from the east because they calculated the time, and it was the right time, right? And then, Peter at Pentecost says, these are the last days. And anyone who has, anyone who has a half a wit, you ever heard that phrase, half wit? You, all you need is a half wit to understand this. You don't have to be a full wit, just a half wit, and you can understand this. That last days, okay, weren't the last days, right? Peter said, these are the last days. It's been 2,000 years. Where's the kingdom, Peter? Right? By the way, if all you read is Acts 2, Peter's a liar. Read 2 Peter. 2 Peter is what Peter writes later. <laughs> And he goes, I know I said that, 
I wasn't wrong. God told me to say that. But read Paul. That's what Peter says. Paul tells you why it hasn't come yet. In 2 Peter. Again, progressive revelation. 2 Peter updates Acts 2. Hmm. You've got to realize, all the Bible is written to you at the same time. It's written to different people at different times. It's progressively revealed. It's in a time context. Put it in its order and read it that way, and you'll get the whole story. Okay? You're in Isaiah 42. Is that where I told you to turn? Isaiah 42, verse 1. Behold my servant, uh, servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment and truth. Okay. Isaiah 42. My servant, in whom my soul delights, he will not cry or lift up his voice. He will bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Do you read it? Do you get it? Look at Matthew chapter... 12. Jesus fulfills part of this prophecy in his earthly ministry. Matthew 12, verse 17. In verse 16, Jesus told people, he charged them that they should not make me known. He says, don't tell people I'm the Christ. Thanks, Jesus, for encouraging us to follow you. Don't tell people I'm the Christ. But why did he do that, people ask? In verse 17, because that's what prophecy said would happen that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah in Isaiah 42. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him. That happened at his baptism. And he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry nor lift up any man to hear his voice in the streets. He will not make a show. Right. Now, even though he did not do that personally, his deeds spoke louder than his words. And people flock to get miracles from him because of his healings. But notice something here. That prophecy says, which is being fulfilled back here in Matthew 12, about the servant upon whom he pours his spirit out. The prophecy says he'll be a judge to the Gentiles. When does that happen? Not in Matthew 12. He stood before Pilate and Pilate judged him. Right? Here is where he judges the Gentiles. That prophecy as a separation of time. And actually, the first part spoke about the future. You've got to recognize that. Okay? Look at Isaiah 61. Just some examples here showing you the, how time separates a lot of these prophecies. And dispensational Bible study teaches us progressive revelation and that time matters. Isaiah 61. Maybe I need some help on this one. This one I want to get Luke chapter 4. Becca, thank you. Luke chapter 4 in verse 16. All of you are in Isaiah 61, while Becca's in Luke 4 verse 16. So Becca, why don't you read Luke 4 16 tell us what it says. And 17. came to Nazareth where he had been brought uh, where he had been brought up and as his custom was he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read and there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah okay now stop for a moment okay. he, he's got the book of Isaiah now you also have the book of Isaiah right stop and ponder the privilege you have <laughs> This book was in the synagogues. Only Jews could touch it, can read it. You have a copy of this book, along with 65 other books, in your Bible. Jesus picked up the book you hold in your hand 2,000 years ago. Okay? Not the, the literal book in your hand. I mean the, the text. Okay? And, and what does it say in verse 7? Continue. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Stop. No, I already told you because I've read ahead. You're in Isaiah 61, right? And Jesus was reading the same words your eyes are gazing upon right now. Because why did he read... Back uh, in Luke chapter 4, 2,000 years ago. Verse 18. Oh, sorry. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Okay, hold on for a second. Let's read Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. Whoa, he's reading the same thing that we have in our hands. You say, this is elementary. I get it, but we're getting to a point here. Becca, read verse 18 and 19. 
He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And oh, sorry. Yeah, and then, and then verse 19, go ahead and read it. Or verse 20, rather. Okay. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled. This day is this scripture fulfilled. Isaiah 61. You can read verse 1, and Jesus wrote that, or read that. And in verse 2, it says, To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, in Isaiah 61, verse 2, there is a comma. In Luke chapter 4, there is a period. Because Jesus stopped, closed the book, and said, This day has been fulfilled. But he didn't finish the sentence in Isaiah 61, verse 2. Jesus, wait a minute, keep reading. It says, And the day of vengeance of our God. Jesus did not come during the day of vengeance. He came to do the first part, the gospel of the kingdom. He will come, fulfill the rest of it. A comma separates 2,000 years. A space separates 2,000 years. A colon separates 2,000 years. Hosea 1, 10 and 11, two verses separate 2,000 years. You need to rightly divide the scripture to know when these things happen, to understand the Bible, or it will be a mess. And you will think this is happening now because it all happened at the same time, right? You see what I'm saying? So progressive revelation is a basic dispensational lesson. We draw charts every two or three months here to keep it in the forefront of our mind. That the Bible is not just a random collection of rules. It's not just a uh, telling of events that all happened once. It's a history of things. And it goes into the future. And what God is doing now is not what he was doing before. It's not what he will do in the future. And we need to respect the times and discern those times. Right? So, I think we'll stop there with that idea and our series ending with the idea of progressive revelation. That Christ came once in suffering 2,000 years ago. He came again with Paul from heaven. He'll come again to receive us into heaven. And he'll return again to the earth in glory to fulfill the rest of the prophecies they didn't fulfill the first time. You see, there's a time difference. We need to discern what time we live. This hasn't happened yet. This hasn't happened yet. We live here. You understand? All of this has happened. This hasn't. Right division. Right? Any, any questions? Any, any comments about how to use your Bible? You can use those verses, by the way, that we were, we were going through, those prophetic verses, to, to show people this dispensational point. They think all the Bible's for them. Okay, we'll show them the prophecies, and, and, and not out of argumentation, but just bring it to their attention that we have to use the Bible a certain way. There's time differences here. You can't just say all the Bible's mine. You can't say all the Bible happened at once. That's not how God wrote it. Okay. Any thoughts? All right. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for instructing us in how your will will be accomplished. You tell us that you've revealed the manifold wisdom uh, and your will for the future, and we thank you for that, that we can discern what you've done, what you will do, what you're doing now, so we won't be confused about who you are and what you promised us and what you haven't, and that we would not be confused on who we are and what we're supposed to do in response to you. We thank you for that mission that you provided for us, and I pray that we would be able to do that uh, more accurately as qualified workmen and soldiers to do your will properly and not cause confusion, okay? Not cause people to blame you, but rather to cause them to glory in you as they trust you and your salvation that you provided for on the cross 2,000 years ago. We thank you, Lord, for your church and every member of the body here. Amen.